Hi, my name is Paul Sargent. Welcome once again to AP European History. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at the rise of totalitarian dictatorships. The big picture here is that the Great Depression created a situation where people looked for simple answers. And those answers were increasingly provided by regimes that wanted to take complete control of the entire society. So to start off with, we want to look at the characteristics of a totalitarian dictatorship. First of all, you're going to have a dynamic leader. This is someone that people are going to look to to kind of rally behind. Secondly, they're going to establish one party rule inside their country. In other words, they're going to outlaw all other parties once their party comes to power. Thirdly, you're going to have the ideology of submission to the state. In other words, Everything should be completely about the state itself, not about the individual. And every decision people make should be towards making the state better. Number four, the regime will to seek to control all aspects of individuals' lives completely. Number five, they're going to try to control all aspects of society so that society revolves around the party and the state and politics. Number six, they're going to use very sophisticated methods of enforcement, including secret police of some sort and military uh, force. And finally, they're going to use technology to solidify their control, especially new technologies of radio. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at what totalitarian regimes did, let's take a look at three of them individually. The first one we're going to take a look at is in Italy with Benito Mussolini. So Italy was under the control eventually of a guy named Benito Mussolini who led a movement he called fascism. Now the word comes from the old Roman fasces, which are sort of ceremonial bundles of sticks with an axe sticking out of them that were used during the Roman Empire to signify power. Um, and he set up this really authoritarian dictatorship here that tried to control the lives of all the people within Italy. One thing he used to do this was a non-military but military-like group known as his Black Shirts. Now these Black Shirts were really ex-soldiers and students who really enjoyed unrestrained violence here. And he used them, and by 1921 we're talking about 200,000 people, he used them to deliberately create disorder and then he proposed fascist solutions of order which would stop all of this. And so really what this did is like the whole middle class kind of flocked to his side and said, hey, we're really scared of socialists, we're really scared of communists, please protect us from all of this. So he decided in 1922 that he was going to march on Rome and officially take over power. Well, it was more of a threat than a reality, but the government kind of uh, bought it. And so King Victor Emmanuel III decides to cede power basically over to him um, and, uh, and, and gives him what he wanted. Um, even though they go ahead and hold the march on Rome anyway, just so that they can say they've done it and kind of have the show there. So basically by 1925, Italy is a completely totalitarian state. And in this state, Everything that the people want is subject to uh, the greatness of the state. One more thing was left to do. In 1929, he signs the Lateran Accords with the Pope, Pius XII, which actually recognized for the first time since the unification of Italy, the state of the Vatican City, and the papacy finally recognized Italy as a, as a real state. Catholicism was to be the state religion, and the church then urged people to support the fascist regime. So at that point, you got the people, you got the church, you got the government, it's all in place, and Il Duce is in charge. But while this was a totalitarian state, it had its shortcomings. There were a lot of things that Mussolini couldn't get under his control. The monarchy was still in place, the armed forces were independent, and while he claimed to help the workers, he generally allied himself with business interests. All of his ideas, though, were observed and admired by someone else. Someone who would take this totalitarian idea and make it even more powerful, Adolf Hitler. Now Mussolini was very successful in Italy, 
but he didn't have the productive capabilities that existed in a place like Germany. And in Germany, there was a guy who looked to Mussolini's example and kind of said, hey, I think I could do this better. His name was Adolf Hitler. So let's take a look at what he did. So when the Great Depression hit Germany, it really provided an opportunity for Adolf Hitler here to take control. He attacked the Treaty of Versailles and the, and the territory lost there. He attacked the weaknesses of the Weimar Republic. He attacked communists. He attacked Jews. Blamed everybody for Germany's defeat. And so his party, the Nazis, began to really gain traction. And they got more and more power votes and seats in the German parliament, the Reichstag. So in light of the Nazi popularity, President Hindenburg of the Weimar Republic appointed Hitler Chancellor of Germany in January of 1933. And he kind of felt like if he kept him close, he could control him. But in February of 1933, the Reichstag burned down. And Hitler blamed the communists for setting the fire and really stirred up terror within the country. People were scared. And when people are scared, they look for easy solutions, and Hitler provided them. And he said, basically, to the, to the people, you have a national emergency. I'm taking dictatorial power as provided by the Constitution. He took it over and he held it until President Hindenburg died in August of 1934. But this is where the Nazi state that we all have heard of has begun. In 1934, Hitler held a plebiscite, basically let the people decide to rubber stamp his, his dictatorship. They did it. 85% voted for him. The office of president was abolished. Hitler was dictator. The Third Reich had begun, and it was all done legally, through the system, by the Constitution, and supported by the majority of the German people. Well, Hitler started to consolidate power by eliminating unemployment through government spending programs and becomes an absolute propaganda machine controlling the press and the radio, having mass meetings to excite crowds, and constantly repeating the message that the Nazi party provides solutions for Germany. In fact, they even replaced the Weimar flag with the Nazi party flag. And it's all settled around the idea of complete devotion to not Germany, but the Fuhrer himself, Adolf Hitler. So by now, the Nazis have complete control. Secret police, the SS, are able to carry out the Nazi uh, regime. But in 1934, Hitler undergoes a purge of the Nazi party, getting rid of all of the disloyal parts of this, especially the brown shirts who had initially brought him to power, using this new part of the SS called the Gestapo. He also makes an agreement with the church. If this sounds familiar, with the Lateran Accords from uh, Mussolini, it should. And the agreement was this. The German state would allow the Catholic Church to continue to exist if the Catholic Church turned a blind eye to a new thing called anti-Semitism. Now, this is probably not a surprise to you, but the big belief of Nazi Germany was in a pure Aryan race. Now, this was made into law in 1935 by the Nuremberg Laws. And the Nuremberg Laws went through and classified Germans and Jews and exactly what that meant. How far back you had to go to have Jewish ancestry in order to be Jewish. By 1938, we end up at an event called Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass, in which Jewish businesses were destroyed, uh, many Jews were beaten, murdered, synagogues were burned, lots of Jews were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. And it was all caused by a minor incident with a minor official and a Jewish boy who was just upset. But it was the excuse for a much larger campaign. In this Jewish state, the Nazi woman was dedicated to love, marriage, and the family. She was something to be admired and protected. And she was something that every German man would fight and die for. Okay, so now that they've established that regime, you can see kind of what's going to be coming here. 
I mean, World War II is not a secret, right? So we've looked at, at uh, Mussolini in Italy. We've looked at Hitler in Germany. Now it's time to take a look at a little bit different regime, Stalin's Russia. So in Russia, with the civil war over, the communists start to pay attention to what's going on in the country. And the problem was really economics with a communist system. And so in 1921, Lenin introduces the thing called a new economic policy. Like he was a flexible guy. He kind of saw, hey, here's the problem. And so it kind of slowed down communist advance here. What he said is that while the government's going to sort of hold on to the big industries here, peasants can own some land, companies can run their businesses. And in fact, he even looks to outside, to capitalists, to kind of help set all this stuff up. He cuts back on terrorism and censorship, and the economy, economy begins to recover. But in 1924, he died of a stroke. So with the loss of Lenin, we have a power struggle between two guys, Stalin and Trotsky. And Stalin is really the one who wins this whole thing. He wanted socialism in Russia. Trotsky wanted international socialism. So Stalin defeats Trotsky, takes control, sends Trotsky out on exile, and ends up getting him killed. In order to consolidate Russia, he creates a series of five-year plans. And the idea is he's going, he wanted to advance Russia industrially by setting some solid goals here. Now, he thought that with force and terror, anything could be done. And one of the ideas here was to collectivize farms. He would take all of the excess labor and move it to the cities. And the people out on the farms would then work the farms collectively. Lots of people were opposed to this and lots of people died because of it. And because the, the food was being moved into the cities where it was needed for industrial production, it was not being given to the peasants who were working the farms and millions died of starvation. Finally, between 1934 and 1938, he undergoes a series of purges. Basically, he eliminates, kills, anyone accused of crimes against the state. Concentration camps, deaths. Basically, he takes everyone who's possibly opposed to him and eliminates the problems before they can start. There will be no competition. He's in charge. He's the guy, and he finally establishes a communist society in what will become known as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. And that's established under Stalin. It's probably the most successful of the totalitarian states because there's absolutely no limit to how much he can control the lives of his citizens. The Communist Party is the only party. It dominates everything, and Stalin dominated the party. Everything is done by the party lines, and everything is followed. He has a secret police. He commands the economy. He focuses on the military. But in a communist system, those people who are in charge get more privileges, benefits, and goods than everybody else. All right, so now that we've looked at these totalitarian regimes, there's a couple things I want to point out. Number one, if you look at this, it's a continuation of tradition in Europe. The countries they arose in, Italy, Germany, and Russia, have strong histories of monarchy in one form or another. Italy's a little weaker than the other two. But certainly, but the whole Hohenzollern dy dynasty in Prussia and the Romanov dynasty in Russia they have a history of strong, absolute monarchs who use a lot of the same tactics that these totalitarian dictators use. The major difference is this. Totalitarianism had technology on its side, a technology that could provide propaganda to the people and could make these individuals look more like one of the people and make them more appealing to the people. But it's all, of course, going to lead to something which is absolutely tragic. These totalitarian regimes are going to end up starting World War II. And that's where our next video segment is going to go. Till then, my name is Paul Sargent. 